when I would start my day at like, I mean, I was up at 530. My husband and I were just talking about that. Um, Because when you do that for so many years, and then you kind of (laughs) stop. And I'm like, I get up at 730 ish now. But that's like, it's late to me. Right. And like 730 is sleeping in going and you think of everybody's at school already. That is the truth. I I know what you're saying. I'm like, I should be in a meeting or something right now. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) I'm just sitting here. (laughs) Right. Right. It's nice. Um, well, thank you so much um, for for coming on today. I know that your time is precious, and so I really appreciate you devoting, um, you know, your time to speak with us this morning on the Classroom Matters podcast. So, for all of you that are listening, I am talking this morning with Dr. Margie, and I'm going to say Van Deven. That's correct. Very oh. good. Your name probably gets said a lot of different ways, it does. doesn't it? I won't even tell you because then you'll start doing it. But Van Deven <laughs> is correct. And uh, we were just kind of we were just chatting uh, a little bit ago about how busy your days are as the commissioner of education in the state of Missouri. Yes. So tell us a little bit about what those days look like. You know, it, it, it's a, it's an exciting. Uh, it's I don't even want to call it a job because it doesn't feel like a job. It is. It feels like something that we do every day to really figure out how to best serve our 918,000 students in 518 school districts and 38 charter LEAs across our state, 37 charter LEAs, I apologize, uh, across our state. And so when you think about um, the state of Missouri, and I'm, I'm not sure people really understand the diversity that truly exists within our state, uh, but we do have very urban, very rural uh suburban and sort of everything in between when we're talking about our communities and our schools, which is a, it's a great place to be and uh, just keeps us busy and trying to, to meet those needs um, of our local schools, um, but also to serve the taxpayers in the state of Missouri, to work closely with the governor's office, to work closely with our state legislators. And of course, um, I serve the state board of education. I I work for the state board of education and um, also um, really oversee the operations of our our state agency and its over six billion dollar budget. Wow! So I want to read a quote from you that I found that I was very intrigued by, and the quote says, "Although I did not come to Jefferson City to engage in political fights, I am willing to fight for children and educators." And I absolutely love that quote that I found. Um, that you had that you had spoken quite a while back. And it's just encouraging to see folks like yourself in positions where you can fight for kids and for education. How hard has it been to really balance the political aspect of what you do and doing what's best for kids? Yes, well, I, I thank you for that. Uh, yes, that was that was taken. That quote was taken uh, right before my my removal uh, about a year and a half ago. Well, two years now, actually, almost exactly two years ago. And so I am back in the chair, really excited to be doing this work. But um, I, I often try to explain that to to the public that uh, I am a classroom teacher. I see myself as a classroom teacher and uh, feel like we are here to really make sure that every child has a chance at success. And Politics really has no place in in that role. Um, this is a it's a nonpartisan role. It's one where we come together to think about what is best for children. Now, I just mentioned uh, that we do need to work very closely with people who have political roles in the state, and that's important. But um, <clears throat> and they have certain roles that they need to, to fulfill that are are very important for the success of our children. But the role of the state board of education is intentionally by design written um, in in a way that ensures that it is nonpartisan in nature. And my role as the commissioner of education uh, is also very, very specific to being uh, nonpartisan and working for on behalf of our our schools and our children. And you started out as a teacher. I did. Were you one of the folks that this was your calling in life. You knew from the time you were a little kid playing school in the basement that you wanted to be a teacher, or was that something that came to you a little bit later in your educational career? How did that all start for you? <laughs> well, you know, that's a, it's a great question. I, it, 
I did play school <laughs> when I was a, a, a little kid. <clears throat> and uh, school is such a part of everything that we do, um, big part of growing up. And I think I, I often thought about the possibility, but I wasn't absolutely convinced. I spent uh, time in in my college years, um, alternating majors a couple of times, but but it ultimately discovered that I just loved to be able to work specifically with ch uh, children and helping them improve themselves. So I always find it exciting uh, to help someone better themselves. And so I always say once a teacher, always a teacher. Yeah. And I think that that's just something that is inherent within us that uh, we have this desire to see people find things within them that they didn't even know was there and um, really be able to maximize the gifts that we have. So uh, sort of, I, I wouldn't say that I had a goal of being a teacher at the earliest of ages, um, but but working with with people certainly was always there, and I did I did declare that major um, back in my days at uh, which was then Southwest Missouri State University, and uh, enjoyed enjoyed being a, a part of that education community ever ever since. Mm -hmm. And I also attended Southwest. So did you? yeah, back You've in the Southwest days. That now. We, I, know. I know, right? You say it and people are like, what? <laughs> right. Um, so we, you never know, we could have crossed paths we in one of our have. classes. Wow. Right. Look at that. <laughs> so what are some things that you miss? You know, because our, our listener base are mostly teachers and it, it, We'll get to later in this podcast about how difficult it is for teachers right now. There's a lot of challenges in education, as you very well know, being on the forefront of most of these challenges for the state of Missouri. But I really, you know, I want to help inspire teachers is to remind them why they're doing the things that they're doing amidst the challenges and the conflict in education right now. What are some of the things that you did as a teacher and that you see teachers doing that are just inspiring? So some of the things, you know, I, I think that that teachers understand this better than most, um, but I think most people understand it. Just that that sense of the light bulb when you're able to explain something in a way or teach something in a way that a, a child didn't grasp it the first time, but then actually gets it. And this, this light bulb goes on and you can see it in everything about them. The face lights up, the hands start getting busy and uh, it, it's transforming right then. That to me was always the reminder of why I was doing what I was doing. Um, for me, the, you know, this is absolutely no secret. Um, it's in every single piece of literature that you might see on the teacher, but it is um, the way that I did that. I, I, I always focused on building the relationships with the students first, um, knowing them, knowing something extra about them, taking time that very first day of school uh, to to uh, learn something new about every student that came in front of me, being at the door to greet them when they come in, um, wishing them well on their way out the door, understanding that they have a lot going on in their lives, um, but that we are really here uh, to to uh, to really learn and, and to improve opportunities for everyone. So I think I did a lot of relationship building and there was always the joke about the teacher doesn't smile until Christmas. I, I did ignore that part, but I will tell you that I, I do believe there is, it's not just about being nice. There was a lot of, I did, I do believe in establishing high expectations from the start. And so when a, I, I would hope that a prior student would would make it clear that that um, when I was in in my classroom we were we were there to learn and and we did take our business quite seriously in the classroom so I think it's that balance of of knowing that establishing high expectations for everyone in front of us every child um, is really key but then recognizing that that our children will get there in, in different ways and and building that relationship is really key so what do I see teachers doing today? Boy, they are going the extra mile. I, I, I hate to confess, but I think I've been out of the classroom for about 15 years now, um, which is is quite some time. It's it's actually probably night and day um, from some of the classrooms that I visit today. And, and the teachers are doing amazing, amazing things with their children. So uh, Again, not only understanding their personalities and knowing who they are and building those relationships, but they are 
really going the extra mile to think about the personalization of learning and understanding um, how to meet children where they are and um, really take them to the next level. Really exciting, um, but absolutely exhausting um, to try to think about how to meet the needs of, you know, 24 people or how, however many students might be in front of them um, on at the same time. Yeah, and I, w- I would agree with that. Looking back as you're talking, thinking about, I've probably been out of the classroom for about 15 years as well. And it, wow, it we is. we did pat crossbow. Oh, no, that would make, <laughs> I was going to say, we probably <laughs> did cross paths at, at um, Missouri State, but go ahead. Yeah, we probably did. But, <laughs> you know, you do see it's so different now. I have a lot of friends that that teach and they're still in the classroom and, you know, we still, you know, go to lunch and have coffee and chat quite a bit. And they're, you know, always telling me about their kids in their classroom. And although the relationship piece to me doesn't seem like it's changed that much, I think it's a little bit harder. And I'd love to know your thought on this. I think it's a little bit harder to personalize the learning as much as you would like for kids with some of the restrictions and mandates on state and national standards. So I, again, I would say that that's part, to me, that's part of the expectation that's in place. Part of the expectation that's in place and establishing that is that every child in the state has the opportunity to be successful. So what a third grader should know in one part of the state, a third grader should know in the other part of the state and making sure that we are really fulfilling um, our obligation to to making sure that every child has the opportunity for high quality education. That being said, um, you know, at the department, we, we have said uh, this expression quite a bit, and I'm not sure it's carried over as much, is that the score should take care of itself. So I, I don't believe necessarily that it's, it's establishing state standards and expectations that are problematic, but potentially, um, and, and I, I've spent the last 12 years of my life really focused on the accountability side of uh, the state system, but really understanding if we've gone too far with uh, ensuring that that it is the accountability system that's driving the learning. I still think there's a, be, be, to be very clear, there is a role for accountability. There is a role to ensure that every child has access to a high quality education. Um, but I do hear quite frequently from teachers and others this intense pressure to meet these demands on testing and so forth that I need to be clear about are not coming, in my opinion, are not coming from the state level. A lot of that is this expectation that's been placed on themselves, in, in, you know, internally to make sure that the points are there or that this benchmark is met and so forth and so on. Um, but done well, I believe that those state standards guide the learning and Uh, At the end of the year, when those tests are put into place, if the learning has occurred, uh, the test scores should take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's a great way to look at it. You know, I, they're there as a guide. They're there as what, what these kiddos should, should be learning. If they get there, that's wonderful. If they don't, what can we do to ensure that we continue the learning so that they do get there? So they can get there. Right. That's right. It may not be in the same time as the the student sitting next to them, uh, but we're still going to try to get them there. Yes. And I I mean, I think that was one of the things, again, not to go back to the accountability too much on this, but that was one of the areas that we, that we made a decision several years ago and, and our, and our accountability statewide accountability system MSEP was to say, four year graduation rate is important, but we, we take it all the way out to seven years because Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter to me how quickly a student graduates. What matters is that when they get a diploma, they're ready and prepared for success in their next um, next placement, wherever that might be. Mm-hmm. If that's if that's in the in the workforce, in military, in college, in technical schools, wherever they go, we want to make sure that they are fully equipped and ready to be successful. So you're right; that might take three years for some. It might take seven for others. Um, and and that really the ultimate goal should be that they're ready. Yeah. And I think that teachers are such creatures of excellence and perfection. They want, they want so many things and they want the best for these kids that they just, that they love and they care for and they want to see them be successful. And so I think as, as educators, and I can say this for myself, I think we put a lot of that pressure on ourselves 
Uh, we sure do. And, and I, I, I uh, so, so appreciate my colleagues who, who do that. They, they are there to serve the students and they want them to be successful. I do think that is one of the help full tools that we're able to provide now with things like growth models and others. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because again, the the question keeps coming up over and over again is, is what is meant by that proficiency level cut, like that line in the sand on the proficiency levels and above or below. Uh, And uh, teachers will get their results back and absolutely be, I've seen them. Mm -hmm. They just, they just feel deflated or devastated, but if they're able to look at, Um, maybe a a student growth score and look at how many of their students were able to improve over time. That's the fulfilling. That's what they see. And they need to understand that they are helping, you know, that child move by a year's worth of growth or two years or, or how are they, um, they are making a difference in in advancing that child in their um, trajectory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and you know, mentioning colleagues, I think in a school setting, when you when you're when you are stressed out, and when teachers do feel that pressure and the devastation, because I felt it, I'm sure you felt it, different years in my career, whether it was as a teacher or an administrator, having a positive climate and culture in a building and a leader in a building that has built up the morale that you can rally around each other and get to the next step and say, it's, it's okay. We're doing our very best. We're all doing what we need to be doing for these kids. We just have to keep moving forward. So I think that's a big part of teacher stress, which I want to jump into is the challenges in education. Uh, the amount of teacher stress, stress and the national teacher shortage that we're seeing across the board. Are you, are we having those kinds of issues in Missouri as well? Yes. And I want to go back to your first comment on that. I mean, the the first part of that, and then I'll take the second part. Um, We we have both just expressed that we have felt that way and that we understand the importance of strong climate and culture and leadership. Um, But I do want to add to that, that the research is also very, very supportive and clear. Uh, John Hattie's research in particular, where he's looking at direct correlation and impact on student performance and collective teacher efficacy is one of the highest levers for improving student achievement. And what that means is that collective sense that we together Mm -hmm. do have that efficacy component, do have the ability to help children learn and advance. And so, but, but often in our schools, there's this sense of competitiveness, which I think is a, on one hand is a good thing, but on the other hand, when we talk about educators, they're team builders, they're team players, and that collective sense of worth. And again, working together for the sake of children is is not only a good thing, it's it's supported in research as one of the number one ways to improve student performance. And so uh, we've spent a lot of time at our department right now working on a continuous school improvement model, which primarily focuses on that collective teacher efficacy in our schools. And we've also spent a lot of time and investment in building better school leaders. Um, we believe great teachers will work, mm-hmm. will work for great leaders. And you know, Hattie talks about that, that the John Hattie, I apologize, Dr. Hattie, that the the freedom to fail is is really important. Um, we have to be able to have set high expectations, but we also have to be able to have the environment where we're able to um, teach our children that it's okay to make a mistake. That's how we can learn from these types of, of situations by, by solving them um, together. So so where we are with, with the teacher, the second part of that question is, yes, I think you've seen the nation as a whole is having a, a real uh, challenge in the teaching profession. Missouri uh, is not immune to that. Uh, we're seeing a decline in the, the number of uh, people who are interested in going into the profession. And I could provide you with all sorts of stats um, but I will tell you that the the one that just really has s- stood out to me and the one that I just think tells the story is that a recent survey was conducted um, and for the first time in history, more parents than not do not want their children, do not desire that their children become teachers. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's just so troubling because I know when uh, I became a teacher, the people who were so proud of me for becoming a teacher, my parents certainly mm-hmm. uh, among them, but it was 
uh, very seen as a very prestigious and exciting career to enter into. And to hear now that uh, some of our students who are interested are actually being dissuaded from from those close to them, that it might not be the best fit. And um, I think that says a lot about the profession itself. I think it says a lot about where we are as a society. And we absolutely must turn that around. The I, I can't imagine... Uh, again, when you talk about student learning, that collective teacher efficacy, it is the teacher in front of that student who has the greatest impact on school level factor, uh, greatest school level impact on what's going to happen. So if we don't have the absolute best teachers in front of our children, um, th that is a real crisis, I believe, ahead for the nation and, and for the, the state and our local communities. Um, I remember I was at a, I was at a conference about a year and a half ago, and Condoleezza Rice spoke, and uh, she made a statement that just stuck with me uh, over and over again. Uh, but it, she said, uh, no country can do more harm to America than America can do to itself if we do not educate our children. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that in terms of America, you think about that in terms of the state of Missouri, you think about that in terms of your local communities, what will we look like if we do not educate our children? I, I can't think of a higher calling than that of the mm -hmm. classroom teacher and how we regain that respect for the profession and make sure that we're taking care of our teachers who are in there is absolutely something you will hear this agency uh, uh, really focusing on and talking about um, for at least uh, the next several years for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, 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 I appreciate you sharing that information and and those uh, that feedback and research that that you just shared because I have not seen or read that but I am I'm a little I'm very disappointed and and appalled that you know more parents aren't proud of their kids or actually trying to encourage their high schoolers and college age children to go into that field and and I don't know you know about you or or what your opinions are on this but you know I I sometimes wonder if it is a just a lack of respect for the the education process itself or the teacher itself because it's no secret that the family dynamic has changed uh society is changing you know there's a lot of things kind of topsy turvy and it just doesn't seem as though sometimes in this country we make education the number one priority and i and i am curious as to wonder if maybe that is the case uh you know i don't i don't know yesterday i i just yesterday i attended the the national that was the kickoff of the international conference for parents as teachers parents mm -hmm. as teachers was a great program that started yeah. in missouri 35 years ago for school districts and um basically the whole premise of this is that parents as teachers, we, we are partners working in this together. Mm -hmm. And so um, I do think that that relationship is absolutely key to the success of our children, that parents are the first teachers and they see themselves as teachers and, and um, that they see their the teachers in their schools as um, partners in the education of their most precious gift, which is their child. And so how do we uh, how do we work together on that? Um, I don't know. I'm not putting that on the on the on the parents that they're not wanting their kids. To, I don't know. I didn't want that to come across that way. I'm not putting that on the parents necessarily. I'm putting that on the profession itself. Mm -hmm. Like, how mm -hmm. do we uh, better communicate the absolute joy of teaching, the absolute fulfillment in teaching? And I, I do think part of that, just part of that, is the salary and the compensation, mm -hmm. and, and as you talked about, the additional work that is now involved with our. Uh, our teachers, they, they come to us every every time I talk to a teacher. Uh, sure, they talk a little bit about the pressures of the standardized testing and things that you mentioned, but primarily what they're asking for today are, are help with mental health services and help mm -hmm. with counseling and help with um, how do they meet the needs of the kids that are coming into the classroom um, with so many so many real issues that they're dealing with because we do know that the child has really does need to be whole before they're able to learn. And so um, all the extras um, that they're wanting now, um, you know, we, we talk about teachers paying out of pocket for Kleenexes and things in their mm -hmm. classroom, but what they're really asking for now is help with, with uh, mental health services and that sort of thing. So you couple that with the additional work and then uh we don't compensate them appropriately. And um, there are, there are just 
some real challenges with that. So I think um, on the one hand, um, we can resolve it with real practical applications of how do we take care of our teachers better. Um, but on the other hand, um, let's let's all do our jobs and reminding everybody about why we went into this amazing mm-hmm. profession, um, why it's of value, and um, how we how do we make sure that we're getting the absolute best best teachers in front of our kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I think that you know partnering with universities and teacher prep programs in a lot of our our colleges and schools around the nation is is truly vital as well to make sure that we're we're adequately preparing young teachers yes. for what is ahead of them. It's not, you know, it's it's not going to be every day of hugs and rainbows and everyone sitting, you know, listening and engaged. You're you're going to have challenging days and you're going to work with like you said, Missouri is one of the most diverse states in the nation. You know, how are we going to be prepared for that? So really working closely with the universities to make sure that our teacher prep programs are giving them what they need before they step foot into that building on their first day um, yes, as a teacher. Great point. And the hardest part for that is that it, I don't really think that's a class. You know, it's one mm-hmm. of those. It's not. It, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's it's working with them to give more hands-on experiences, residencies. Um, a lot of people want yeah. to do things like pr- propose three-hour courses in cultural competency. That's it, mm-hmm. it's hard to read. I mean, that reading the background information is helpful, but you have to mm-hmm. live it. You really do have you to do. get in there and, and work together. So you do. Yeah. And you know, I know it's, it's funny because I'm kind of chuckling, but, um, uh, you know, I had, uh, on, on the show, we had, um, Stephanie Kaszowski, who is leads the, the teacher prep studio schools model at the university of Missouri, St. Louis. And they, and they throw, not throw, but kind of, you know, they throw these, these want to be teachers into a classroom setting and their student teaching model looks much different than the ones that you and I probably went through. Right. You know, I was in like one class with one teacher for however many weeks. Right. And I kind of came in and just sat in the back of the classroom and watched a little bit, didn't really feel like I was absolutely part of it. And then I went with another teacher for another, however many weeks and that was it. Right. 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 Um, and so when I started my first position, like, you know, 20, whatever years ago, I was kind of lost and uh, I actually started as an overflow teacher, which means I got hired in September because they had way too many kids in the in the grade level that I was teaching. And at that time, it was just, okay, every teacher pick a couple of kids <laughs> that you want to give to the new teacher. Wow. <laughs> so I'm sure you can only imagine yeah. what kind of a year <laughs> approach, right? <laughs> that I had. And I was like, I, I don't really know if this is what I signed up for. So point being, you know, to, to those teachers that are listening and, and either just starting out on their career or even veteran teachers that I know are really facing some challenges right now, the reason that you're doing it is because you want these kids to be successful and we all have the same goal right. and you want to build those relationships with them and make an impact on their life. And so we continue to do what we do even through the challenges um, that you would have in any occupation that you chose. That's right. And, you know, I'm excited because I, I hear about that more and more. I am a, uh, you know, the Simon Sinek book, but it was really a mentor of mine who who read his book, who mm-hmm. who always told me every day, know your why, know your why, know your why. Why are you doing what you're doing? And uh, lead with your why. And I've been more and more excited because I've been going to uh, conferences across the state and listening to school leaders speak to their teachers and others. And they're really talking more in terms of living your why. And, I, you know, I just think that's really powerful. If we always are able to keep in the in, in our forefront, the, in the decisions that we're making, in the way that we're approaching um, every day in our classrooms, that we understand and are living the why we're there, which is to serve and uplift our children. And um, I've been very, very um, inspired by those messagings that I've been hearing across the state. Um, so I do think we're on a on a bit of a turn here, and but we we do have a, a long ways to go before. Uh, we get that teacher profession back to where it absolutely belongs. Yeah, and if you're and if you're a teacher and you're listening, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, we appreciate the work that you do. Don't give up. Talk to your colleagues. Uh, surround yourself with people that can support you. Um, what you're doing is making an impact on children every day, and what you're doing, Margie, is definitely making an impact on not only students but communities, 
teachers, parents, um, everyone that's involved. So I thank you for what you do on a daily basis for us as well. Well, thank you very much. And yes, I echo your words on uh, the great things um, that you said about our teachers. Thank you. Keep working. Keep keep going. And I appreciate you doing stories like this to remind um, the public and to remind our teachers how, how grateful we are for them. So that will wrap up this episode of Classroom Matters with me, your host, Christy Houle. Once again, thanks to Dr. Margie Van Dieven, and we will see you next time. Thank you so much. <laughs>